So actually, I'll just let you guys introduce yourself, if that's OK. Um, my name is Dan Frazier. Uh, most of the work I do on the kernel team is um, I64 port work. You can use this uh, microphone. Hello? Hello? So my name is Sven Luther, and I'm in charge of the port PC port of the kernel. I'm Holmes. I uh, work primarily on the 2.4 kernel and security updates for Sarge. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Kwan, and I work on uh, Spark 2.426, and um, as well as do helping Holmes out with i386 stuff when I can. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Andres Salomon. Um, I work on 2.6 kernels, i386 stuff, and sometimes security stuff. And that's us uh, that are here. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll just take a few minutes break and, uh, till the silence. Okay. Good. So as I said right before uh, the two minutes, uh, my name is Dan Frazier. I'm a member of the Dev Kernel team. Most of my responsibilities are around the i 64 port. Uh, so the outline of this talk is I'm going to give a little bit of history about um, how the Debian Kernel team came to be about a year ago, um, an overview of who we are and the kind of stuff we're doing today, uh, a discussion about Debian patches, you know, the kind of stuff we accept into the kernel, stuff we reject and why stuff we're working on um, for the etch release, and stuff you guys can do to help, should you want to. So I'll start with this. Uh, Herbert Zhu was the king of kernels for I don't know how long. Whenever I started on the Debian project, he was maintaining the kernel source package. Um, every release, uh, he also did the alpha port and the x86 port. Uh, Herbert you know, did a lot of great work, and he was very responsive to bug reports, very responsive to security, as far as I could ever see. Um, but, you know, about a year ago, I guess this was May of last year, uh, he chose to retire and resigned from the project. And that left a big gap. Um, so, this little timeline of what happened about that time. So, May 4th uh, of last year, Herbert decided to retire. Uh, the next day, uh, Andres proposed that maybe we do a kernel team, um, citing the known team as uh, a successful uh, example of a team in the Debian project. Uh, TBM announces a tent to form its kernel team um, about two weeks later, I guess. Uh, WLI, uh, William Lee Irwin III, uh, announces intent to NMU kernel packages, you know, kind of before the kernel team was actually announced, but that was just four days later. And he did a first NMU of uh, the kernel source stuff, just changing the maintainer over um, on June 15th. So as you can see, this, this all happened pretty quickly uh, and, and got going. So some of the initial challenges, and I wasn't really present in a lot of this, so this is me just going back and looking at mailing lists, um, was understanding a lot of the existing patches. So if you looked at a kernel source package from like the Woody time frame, you would see just a bunch of monolithic kernel patches, one for each release. Uh, he, um, patches weren't split up by functionality, and it was you know, unclear about why certain things were in there. So I remember uh, 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 Christoph Helwig, and probably a lot of your work too, going through um, all the different patches, splitting them up, figuring out what needs to go upstream, what we should drop, whatnot, and that, that took quite a bit of time. Um, then version sync was a big issue. So if you look back at the Woody time frame, um, since Herbert was doing x86 and alpha stuff, you would see that those would track the kernel source releases as they would come out very quickly. Uh, other architectures, um, and I was doing some i64 stuff at the time, um, so I remember like having to just kind of pull his page to see when new kernel source was being updated. Security release comes out, you know, and unstable, it wasn't, there was no notification to the other reporters that you need to rebuild against this later version for a security fix. So, you know, versions got out of sync pretty quickly that way. Um, I64 would be like a version or two behind just because we didn't know there was something new. Um, and so, you know, all other architectures just had to track the source independently. So in the Woody time frame, you know, we had a 2.2.10 kernel source tree for PowerPC APUS, 2.2.19 for ARM, 2.2.20 for M68K, PowerPC, and Spark, 2.2.22 for Alpha, 2.4.16 for x86 and ARM, 
2417 for S390, PowerPC, APUS, and MIPS. 2418 for Alpha I386 and PowerPC. 2419 for MIPS. And some architectures didn't even use kernel source. <laughs> <laughs> Those were uh, HPPA and IS64, I think, at the time. So as you can see, this is pretty ridiculous. And you know, if you hadn't noticed, there hasn't been a kernel security update to Woody in some time. And I'll bet you this is why. Doing a single patch into Woody to fix a security update across all sources means a rebuild of all these kernel source packages, the porting effort that that requires, and then rebuilding all of these architectures against it. Pretty, pretty insane. So there's a total of 10 kernel source packages that time, um, all sitting in Woody, or still are. Uh, so here's an overview of the kernel team. Um, Debian developers and non-Debian developers. I think everybody here is a Debian developer. Um, there's also William Lee Irwin and Christoph Helwig, which I don't think are Debian developers, but they're very active. Uh, Owen Irwin. What's his last name? Yuri, Yuri Smarkov. Oh, Yuri Smarkov. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and Frederick Schuler. Schuler. Right, right, right. So there's a, there's a lot of other people, but... Um, are, are the, anyway. Um, so... We maintain a number of kernel packages, the kernel source stuff and the kernel image stuff, but we don't do everything. Um, right now, everybody on the kernel team is concentrating on Linux stuff. There's no free BSD, there's no herd on the kernel team. Um, and ARM and N6AK are maintained outside of the kernel team, although I saw the ARM guy um, is here. Hello. And it looked like you were joining the kernel team today or looking into it. Yeah. So awesome. Um, come on down if you want. <laughs> no, OK. Um, and we also do the maintenance of kernel-related packages. If you look in our subversion tree, you'll see stuff like InnerRD tools, CrownFS, and make VM Um You guys just jump in if you have anything to say. Um, so I'll go over some of the stuff we're, we're currently doing. Uh, one thing we need to do often is work with the Debian installer team. Uh, the Debian how many of you guys know about UDubs and how the Debian installer is built up? Okay, so that's about, you know, I'd say half the people. Um, so the kernel image is a very monolithic package. I mean, it provides kernel modules, but it has all the modules and the kernel image all in one big kernel image package. Uh, DI is a, uh, I missed your correction, it's a highly granular um, system for a highly modular installer. Um, so we take the kernel image and we actually split modules into different um, logical groups. So you'll have the XFS modules for the XFS file system. Uh, you'll have a set of SCSI modules, the SCSI core modules, which are um, what we consider the most popular um, SCSI modules you might want on a system. So we take that kernel image and we have a build dependency on it to this Linux, or this Linux kernel DI package has a build dependency on that package where it copies all the modules from the system into separate small UDEB components. So that way, with the Debian installer, you can build a custom Debian install image that has XFS support by providing you know, just the UDEBs you need for XFS. That way, you can make it fit on you know, a floppy or whatever. So this transformation right here is um, a mechanism for doing that. So you'll see Linux kernel DI packages in the archive. Uh, this makes version sync problematic, because if we have a 268 version 3 version of a package, and then we build Linux kernel DI from that, we kind of need to have that, uh, both those things in the archive to satisfy GPL requirements. But if we actually do something like update the 2683 to 2684, now DI is out of sync. And you know, even worse than that, and I'll get into ABI stuff more later, but if the ABI changes, then the package name changes, and there's a lot of conflicts that are brought up there. So security is something that um, the kernel team handles for unstable and testing. Um, Horms does a lot of that work. Uh, there's nobody on our team that's currently on VendorSec. So we don't, you know, similar to the testing uh, security team, we don't monitor VendorSec. We don't have, um, uh, we, we don't recognize stuff that hasn't come through a public channel yet. But we do get security reports from various places, including the testing security team. I've seen the Ubuntu people give us lists of stuff. Where other places do you get? Uh, also from the upstream stable tree. Okay, upstream stable tree. Uh, so a lot of monitoring goes on there, but um, really we count on users, it seems, to give us bug reports to which we can respond and patch stuff. 
Uh, Holmes is currently maintaining a security branch for Sarge, um, but what's unclear to me is whether or not the security team will actually use that. Has, has that been decided? That's, that's very unclear. Okay, so that, that's something that's very unclear right now. Yeah, Mr. Mike. Um, we kind of can't do Okay, sorry. Sure. So he asked uh, whether or not the security branch is actually going to be used by the security team, and uh, we have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Basically, we're hoping if we can get it up to scratch, then that'll be something that they want to use. But uh, right now, the security team, and particularly Joey, is very busy, so he's very hard to get in contact with. So, so right now, we're not really sure if, if our team is doing stable security support, but, but we're maintaining a branch just in case. OK. So ABI changes and why they suck, uh, and they do. Uh, a change in the kernel, uh, an ABI change, you know, is a change in the kernel module ABI. So something that changes an interface that would make your modules no longer be able to load um, once you upgrade to the new kernel. This is something that upstream um, kernel.org people definitely do not guarantee. Um, they have a file called stable API nonsense in the kernel source tree, which describes why ABI and API changes aren't guaranteed and aren't necessarily a good thing for the kernel. They state reasons like um, changing an interface will actually explicitly force people to update um, their interfaces and make sure that those are secure, um, and issues with uh, maintaining backwards compatibility and not wanting to waste kernel development's time with it. We, or if you look at a kernel image source, or kernel image binary package name, you'll see the ABI encoded right after the upstream kernel name. So right here you see 268-2. So this is the second ABI role of the 268 kernel for 686. Um, often, you know, if you're running SARS or something and you want to run a stable kernel, you'll just want to be able to run app get update, app get upgrade, and track that. For that purpose, we provide a meta package, um, like kernel image 26686. So if you have that installed on your system, and you apt-get dist upgrade. If the ABI changes, you'll follow along with it. So when dash 3 comes out, you'll get the upgrade. Yes? How do you actually check the ABI changes? How do you actually check for the ABI changes? Uh, Dylan? On the else maintainer, and it used to just suck when, you know, 2418 would get updated from, say, dash 9 to dash 10. Uh-huh. And then I'd get all these bug reports saying, why don't my modules load anymore? And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> is asking, uh, so he's asking, so he's asking, how do we know when the ABI changes? Um, and as the also maintainer, it kind of sucks when all of a sudden his modules don't load in a kernel anymore. So I don't think we have an automated process at this point. I know that you wrote a script um, that can check and examine that. Um, Ubuntu is actually uh, using the script right now. We're working on a single source packaging. Um, and that script will be in there as well. So I have some scripts that I run which basically compare, it actually just does a diff on the system map, and I run that before I upload kernel sources. So if you see kernel sources uploaded by me, the chances are they don't have an ABI change you weren't expecting. <laughs> but that's not always the case. <laughs> um, I have also something to say about that. Um, I feel that all the people like you which maintain third party modules should integrate more with the kernel team and have some, my, pl my intention is that we have some infrastructure in case of a new kernel upload, there is an ABA change, we know about it, and we trigger an automated or semi-automated rebuild of all the external kernel module, which means that you will have, should maintain your ASA modules inside or other modules inside the subversion repository or a separate subversion repository or some infrastructure which will allow us to do automated new builds. I have sent some, some mail about this uh, to the kernel, Debian kernel mailing list, but it was mostly ignored. <laughs> so I hope this will change uh, right now. I, I feel that else is a special case since it moved from being external to internal to the kernel in 6. Yes. Um, all I was going to say was that I'm more than happy to start talking to you guys more directly. Um, the fact that the modules moved from being, being, you know, now that they're in the kernel in 2.6, which means that all, all the bugs get reported on now, so now your fault, not mine. Okay. <laughs> well, you could have... All the uses and everything like that are now, you know, not really my fault. Mm. Okay. So, but for the other module maintainers, it will be great if 
we cooperated and maybe you will have some ALSA uh, out of CVS or whatever. Just to paint the picture of the whole ABI change thing a little better. Um, well, for example, the last big time it happened and we had all of this um, DI suckage as a result, um, it was just because of security fix, which um, I believe it was related to, was yeah. that the TTY locking stuff? I think so. And yeah. basically that's something that's a cost structure. Yeah. So when a struct changes and obviously when a variable um, disappears or is renamed and stuff like that, that's what causes the ABI change and it will prevent modules from being, from resolving their symbols and loading. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to make sure people understood what it, what it actually was. The last time this happened was particularly problematic because, uh, well, it was problematic because firstly we didn't see it coming. But the thing that made it really hurt was it was a change essentially to the task struct, which basically meant almost every symbol changed. So it wasn't like a couple of modules broken, it was everything broke. Yeah, and right now we're in a situation where there's a pending security fix um, that will change the ABI. That we just can't get in yet because uh, of issues with the D with uh, Debian installer. So I'll get to that in a second. So one issue um, with the with the ABI changes is that it changes the package name. So kernel image two six eight two becomes three. So that forces us through new. So when we're doing this right about release time, we need to get all of these architectures rebuilt, um, uploaded into incoming, and then they all have to pin new. And so that has its normal delays, and that kind of slows stuff down a bit. Um, but also with the package name change is that it breaks an interface with DI. DI has, inside each release, um, a list of kernel image names that it shouldn't you know, suggest as installations or, or the stuff it actually uses as an install kernel. Um, once you change that, then it can no longer down, down, download UDEBs from a mirror and pull um, the proper version. So you can't have a dash two uh, version uh, a DI running a dash two ABI of a kernel pull down the dash three version of the modules, they just won't load, and that's intentional. So this sucks for DI, and that also ma and that makes it so we can't really have um, a cohesive way to upload new ABI changes. Hopefully, security.debian.org um, won't have this restriction, because in theory you could install with DI, upgrade to the latest version in stable, and then pull a new ABI version over from security.debian.org. But that also means that when we do point releases and stuff, that we need to um, spin DI. Uh, so I'm going to go on to an overview of Debian patches, um, the kind of stuff that we provide in Debian and what we don't. So the kind of patches the kernel team likes is stuff like security fixes, driver fixes, and stability fixes. Uh, these are all things that are, in theory, upstreamable, things that make our users' lives better. You know, there's, real, there's really no reason to say no to these things. But those patches that we generally reject is stuff like new features. Um, you want the latest version of software to spin that hasn't been accepted upstream? Well, there's probably a reason it hasn't been ex accepted upstream. So we try not to keep that out of there. And we also don't want to maintain interfaces that may change before they actually get a, um, accepted upstream. Uh, stuff like out of tree drivers, same situation. If the driver hasn't been submitted upstream, who knows how long it's going to last or who's going to be maintaining it. We don't want to provide something for users and then take it away later. And even worse than that would be maintaining it ourselves after the fact. And, you know, just, just your favorite patch set, you know, wh whatever. It's not something that um, needs to go into the Debian kernel. So pretty much, you know, if you really think this patch should be put into Debian, submit it upstream. Um, submit it to kernel.org, let people review it, um, get it accepted into a later version. Um, I, I've often seen these guys backport fixes or new bits of functionality from later versions that our users want, as long as we know that there's a forward path, um, a forward path for it. So going on, Sarge is now done. What do we do about 2.4? This is the big question that Horms has right now. Uh, can we drop 2.4 from SID and testing? If we could, it would make our lives significantly better. Uh, we could be able to ditch InnerDRD tools, in theory, because InnerRamFS is, is up and coming. If you guys haven't looked at the InnerDRD tools source code, how many of you have? How many of you have seen InnerDRD tools? It patches. Yeah, so it's, it's, awful, it's, 
it's very horrible. It's this huge, huge piece of shell. Is, what, you gonna say something, Andres? I was just gonna ask how many of you wish you hadn't. <laughs> Sack same people. I, I work with Herbert. This is how he works. He just writes huge globs of shell. Right. And then you're looking at him going, but it's like ten, ten, like, ten times shorter in Perl. Yeah. So his comment is, is that he, work, he works with Herbert, and this is the kind of stuff Herbert does, is write huge bits of shell code to do stuff, when it could be like 10 lines in Perl. Um, yeah, and I, I've, I learned a lot from reading Herbert's shell code. Uh, he uses a lot of stuff that I've just never seen before and have to figure out. Won't see again. What's that? And won't see again. Won't see again, yeah. It's you don't read my scripts? <laughs> uh -oh. yeah. I've learned some things from Herbert, too, and I actually use them. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I took over I64 packaging, I went on and I just created my own set of packages because I could not understand what he was doing. Over the period of the next year, I would gradually un figure out, oh, that's what he was doing back here and pull that bit of code back in. And over time, I just essentially went back to what he had. I just now understood it. So it's the last stuff I don't have. Oh, 15 minutes. Um, OK, so uh, it would be great if we could ditch internet tools. Problems with going to a 2.4 kernel is that MIPS doesn't have um, a 2.6 kernel yet. Um, it has, I guess upstream just hasn't been ported forward. And you were saying that Spark32 SMP sucks in 2.6? It's just completely broken. <laughs> yeah, okay. and um, there's talk of actually, in, because of the advantages for all the rest of the architectures um, migrating to 2.6, there's a, just a motion to just drop the whole SMP thing because, heck, your toaster is probably faster these days anyway. Yeah. My Spark32 is best served as a monitor stand right now. What was an example of a multi-weight Spark32 box? I know plenty of Spark32. Spark what? 3,000? was asking for an example of a multi-weight Spark32 box, and you said Spark3000. So are, are there other issues with 2.6 that you guys are aware of, or 2.4? They're the main. I wasn't aware of the Spark problem, but the MIPS one is the main issue I'm considering right now. Uh, well, basically, the only thing reason I'm considering doing 2.4 at all. Um, basically, my consideration is that by the time we get round to doing Etch, anyone who can be using 2.6 probably will be, and so 2.4 is going to be pretty marginal. Uh, as one more data point, and, and Sven Luther maybe knows a little bit about this. Um, I follow the M uh, M68K build and Debian. 68k lists. Um, at one point, there was an M68k subarch that had trouble with 2.6 as well. Has that been addressed, or is that another case of just digit? I don't remember which one. At this Probably. Point. I mean, this slide is really we're trying to open a discussion about this, which right. will go beyond this uh, presentation. If Wilder's here, maybe he can <laughs> tell us. He's right here. <laughs> there is work on uh, 2.6 from 6k, but uh, last I checked, it's not really stable yet on most sub architectures. They're working on it, um, but they're working on it for quite long now, and I'm not really sure what's going to happen with it. But yeah, not not ready yet. Most sub architectures support uh, 2.4. In fact, all sub architectures except for Mac. Uh, support 2.4 very well. Uh, 2.6 is not not ready yet, I think. All right, thanks. And uh, on on the Power PC side, we we still need a uh, 2.4 for the Apus port. I took Simon is working on it, and uh, I had some Nubus patch that nobody tested yet, which is not yet ported to 2.6, and we have also some problem with the old world Miboot. Uh, mi boot, yes, mi boot uh, installation method. So, but that are very really minor problems, and we could drop them because Apus, I believe, apart from Simon, nobody is using it anymore. And uh, the same for the other architectures, sub architectures. So, so there's likely going to be problems with DI as well because you know DevFS is now deprecated in 2.6 kernels. So I, I have a feeling they're going to want to do something you know that doesn't rely some sort of hybrid detection that no longer relies on DevFS, is, and that kind of leaves us with SysFS and stuff like that that's only in 2.6. So it would be great to get rid of it, uh, get rid of 2.4. Um, 
there's a lot of stuff that's been happening lately. And I've seen Andres and uh, uh, Yuri working on quite a bit on IRC, is moving to a single source package. Um, right now, there's a Right now, building a kernel is multiple layers. There's a kernel source package that we start with and we all share as a base. Then from there, some architectures have kernel patch packages specific to their architecture. Um, that's pretty much gone away in a, in a lot of cases with 2.6. Then there's also the image build on top of that. So we, we have multiple layers. Um, what we're moving to now is going to a single source package so that you have one, one package that you build on different architectures and the kernel images are spit out there. This will help keep a lot of things in sync. It'll let the build these do the work that we've all been doing by hand as porters. Um, and we'll still provide the kernel tree for external architectures, which I, I guess there's just one now. But um, the kernel tree mechanism, how, how many people here are familiar with kernel tree versus kernel source? Do you know the differences? Very few. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through that in a second. Um, and one, one other thing that this single source package will give us the opportunity to do is actually rename the package to Linux kernel because we may no longer be the only kernel in Debian for much longer. <laughs> so with, with that, let me give you guys a brief, like, uh, do you have a kernel source installed here, kernel tree? Uh, yeah, check. Oh, well, OK. So let me go on to the next slide, and then I'll let you check. Sure, go for it. <laughs> I, I know it's installed there. Um, ooh, non-free firmware. This is a slide I, I just added because I'd forgotten about it. Um, one issue we're working on right now is there, there's various DFSG non-compliant bits of firmware in the kernel source. TG3 is the best example that most people are familiar with. Your question? Yes. About the Linux kernel rename, is that uh, already decided? I mean, it's going to be Linux kernel, or? Uh, it's going to be, oh, go ahead. Not quite. We had a discussion about it. Um, and basically, we were talking about the source package name, calling it Linux-26. Um, and then the binary packages, Linux image um, 2612, or whatever. Um, although, yeah, but we need more discussion about that. Okay. I ju I'm just asking because uh, I uh, maintain the GNUMAG Pistachio, and I'm part of the K3BSD team. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to unify the, 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 the name for all kernels in Debian. So if it's not yet, I mean, if it's decided, uh, I'd like to, to, to change the, the, the names of the other packages. You should, uh, are you subscribed to Debian no, kernel? No, I should. I know. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we should probably discuss on Debian kernel. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, maybe at some point we can have a Debian cross OS kernel list or something too, so that you don't have to see all the noise on, on Debian kernel. Um, all right, so non-free firmware. So um, how, how many guys are familiar with the with a binary blob? Do you know what that is? Okay, that, that's most everybody here. So binary blob is just a dump of hexadecimal in a .h file or a .c file. Um, that is actually compiled code. Um, uh, compiled blob of firmware. <laughs> Obviously, that's not DFSG free if you consider that, that firmware as the software that's under the DFSG. So what we've been doing so far is uh, uh, going ahead and shipping it in Sarge. Sarge, we left all that firmware in there. Um, but now uh, Andres has been working on a kernel modules non-free package, um, where all the modules that can be redistributed um, live. Um, so, that, so they're non-free, but distributable. And that's a fine line there. So um, the, the difference there is that uh, non-redistributable stuff is stuff that we haven't been given permission to even send out to uh, our users. Um, you can usually tell by looking at the license. Go ahead. Uh, there's about eight drivers in the current uh, Linux kernel tree that are non-distributable uh, because of their firmware. For those of you that use the TG3 driver, um, you'll notice that initially the firmware was stripped because we could not distribute it um, at all due to the licensing. Um, we've resolved that with 2.6.12, so that one will be going back in. Um, but there are still six or seven more that we need to work on to uh, get permission to distribute. Mm. So um, Andres and uh, Spinsome as well have been working with the copyright holders upstream to get that permission and actually get patches upstream into the kernel source that change the licensing to explicitly say that the stuff is redistributable. 
Uh, it still doesn't make it free by Debian's definitions, but um, we can at least put it in the non-free repository. That'll, of course, have implications with DI, because if you need the TG3 driver to install, then therefore you need to have um, some UDEB of these non-free kernels as well. On the media, yes. Uh, and there's a wiki page here that uh, these guys put together that lists kind of the current status of where, um, where we are with each of these copyright holders and which drivers are currently in this non-free section and which ones um, are not. Uh, init Ramafest is something that Jeff Bailey's been working on for Ubuntu. Uh, how many people know what Init Ramafest is? Okay, so it's about half again. Um, it's a new feature in 2.6, which is... Uh, a, a replacement for InterRD, uh, an attempt to replace InterRD. InterRD is a simple block device, um, or a simple block file system, I don't say it right, a block file with a file system on it that has um, all the modules and stuff you need for booting. And that's what InterRD tools creates for you when you install a kernel. Uh, InterRamFS inter doesn't require file system code at all. It's a CPIO archive that's kind of tagged on to your kernel image. Um, so right now we have CRAMFS, it has to be installed in every kernel, it has to be loaded all the time. But we'll be able to drop that if we do this. Um, unpacking happens early, early enough to say load firmware, should you need it for your SCSI device or whatever. Uh, these things are actually stackable, so you can have multiple um, in a RAMFS CPIO archives tagged together and they'll just overlay on top of each other as you load. Uh, some stuff I'm not too familiar with, but magic root dev naming goes away. Um, I remember they used to do stuff with dev root. Uh, yes. I yeah. didn't understand the shell. But uh, now the name scheme is going to be the same before boot and, and during boot. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and right now the way InterMFS works, or did whenever I put together this paper, was it had hot plug and UDEV built inside. And it just had all the modules that you need um, you could possibly need to boot and let's hot plug and UDEV you know, go about its business of doing hardware discovery the same way it would if you were um, booting into a normal system. That works well for Ubuntu because I think they have you know, memory requirements that aren't as stringent as some of the Debian's users will be. Uh, so we don't know if that'll work for us or not. Do you guys know if there's been any discussion about that? So I'm, I'm not sure what we'll do for Debian as far as hardware discovery and stuff. It'd be ideal that if we don't have to do the InterRD tools thing of creating an InterRD image in the post install, it'd be awesome if we could just have it all prepackaged. Um, that would take away a lot of the uh, uh, differences between installations. And bugs. And bugs. So Horm said about half the bugs we see is related to InterRD tools right now. <laughs> and we get a lot of bugs, so that's, that's a big number. And the Uber feature of this is that it may just get rid of NRD tools for us if we can get rid of 2.4. Uh, what can you do to help? Um, so a lot of people in the Debian community, I'm sure, just run your own kernel. Um, but if we can get more people testing the Debian kernels before we do a release. Do we have a question? Sure. Uh, in response to that patch you just mentioned, which looks quite interesting, I do have one question. Um, the current average kernel size right now for the normal kernel, not the boot up kernel for DI, is around 15 megs, which is already fairly huge in my opinion. And by the time you had the built-in UDEV and hot plug implementation, we're probably gonna be getting closer to 20 megs. Right. And that, to me, the, the, the default Debian kernel size is a big concern because I get to do a lot of installation on hardware that has extremely limited size for the boot partition, for instance. So I'd like to, uh, your, your feedback on how you intend on keeping the kernel size to more reasonable and ideally shrinking it from its current size. Can I reply to that? So first, what you are mentioning is not really the kernel size, but the kernel plus initRD size. And the only reason it's growing so fast for you is that you are you are using uh, in the slash etc slash mk initRD slash mk initRD dot conf file 
you have modules equal most be default, which will put most modules in it and make you a huge, 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 huge uh, init RD, which is the problem. The same thing is to change to modules equal depth, which makes a much more reasonably sized module. The, the not, not so good, and okay. The, the problem with that is that the in, Intel people or the main kernel people, they don't like it to do that because they were not sure it will not break in some case. And we had history going on and initrd tools were not so nice and stuff like that. So it is possible to have reduced kernel size. On PowerPC, we built kernel which fits in four megabytes, including the initrd, and there is no major problem. I don't know how it will scale with the initramfs init stuff, but it may be a problem. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask about, can you hear me? Um, if you guys had any thoughts about dealing with uh, out of tree kernel patches, um, I deal with to kind of intrusive kernel patch packages and it's for the user there's kind of a high barrier for actually using those patches because you have to download the patch apply it to the kernel kernel source and then build a kernel your own kernel so you can't really track the kernel images as easily so I'm kind of curious if you guys have any thoughts about how to um, make that process a little easier for the users. I know one thing I could do is with a kernel patch is build images uh, and then users could install those image packages but that's kind of a pain and um, I don't know if any, there's any thoughts about making module assistant type interface for kernel patches or? I was actually going to mention module assistant. Um, that is something I would like to do in the long term is to get an interface like that to both manage um, currently installed kernels as well as external modules that are compiled against it and kernel patch packages. Um, I've brought it up before, but until we get the single kernel source thing worked out, we are all kind of, you know, struggling to just keep up at this point. So that should uh, that should allow us to get some free time to work on such things. So this is a follow up to Mika's question. Um, I'm the maintainer of the suspend two kernel patches. Now whether you guys like that or not. <laughs> It seems to be a bit of a problematic issue. Anyway, um, we were thinking about working on <coughs> converting it all to modules so that we can actually integrate this with the running kernel, which would kind of solve this problem. I'm wondering whether you guys have experience with that and whether um, this would be possible on a generic level or whether this is going to be really hard to do for the average kernel patch. So is your question around like maybe having an upgrade automatically rebuild a set of modules? Well, not really, no. I'm, I'm, a kernel patch changes the source and then has to be re recompiled. A kernel module um, replaces, it's, it's, it's monkey patching in some ways. It replaces parts of the code um, with other implementations. And you could, in theory, replace those parts that you actually patched with separate um, function calls that you load from modules so that the functionality comes from modules which you can then insert into the kernel images that you provide rather than having expecting the users to build their own kernel images for after applying the patches. Well, not that I have any useful information on this, but that would that's you're basically talking about adding kernel hooks for modules for like functions that aren't prepared for that sort of uh, well, for lack of a better word, intrusion. Uh, so, I think this is the kind of feature that we would like you to submit a patch for. <laughs> yeah, I'll have it up by tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. I think we have time for just one more. Um, maybe two more. Okay, there is a small question about the real-time patches, these more Monari patches, uh, and I know that they have been started with the upstreams, and there has been a lot of discussion in current mailing about the real-time patches, and I think that they have been mostly directed because um, they include a lot of 
uh, this much time in interactive multimedia applications, but they may be forced one or two percent penalty for some web server applications. And I also know that because they affect deeply internal kernel, they can be so easily applied by normal users. So is there been any discussion about this uh, real-time preemptive patches or even having, like there is currently this SMP kernel as parallel real-time kernel that could be used for multimedia applications. And I think that this was is not that, that no one uses multimedia because if you like compare like Apple or something where this responsible kernel that could be used real-time, this kind of multimedia applications that can use it. So I just hope that this get under discussion to having kernel with real-time patches. And I also like your opinions about that. Uh, so essentially, you want to know if we can have separate versions of the kernel with uh, preemptive real time support? Yeah, or to me, it's being more separate. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, there's no answer to that. I know that we have preempt on right now in some kernels, and we really shouldn't in a lot of them. Um, like the access support kernel right now has some problems with preempt. Um, but I don't really know if, if you guys have discussed it. I think it kind of relates to a discussion we've been having with each other, which is how can we reduce the number of flavors, um, which is basically with the current thinking is the overhead of having SMP kernel running on a unique processor. Our machine is probably negligible and it's not worth the effort. Um, this ties into your question because essentially if real time is working upstream, which I believe is currently not, um, every time I see a discussion of it on Linux kernel mailing list, um, there's several schools of thought, no one agrees with each other. Um, but if that was working and it did only present a small overhead to, say, the web server, um, I don't think there would be any problem with incorporating that into the Debian kernel. But there's, as I understand it, the status of the code is just not ready. Uh, so in the future, yes, now. No. Okay, uh, I'm dreadfully sorry, but we can't take any more questions throughout the time. But please uh, feel free to come up to the kernel team and uh, ask them. Um, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you very much. <laughs>